A Football Life is presented by Chase. There has to be a certain mindset that you possess to play this game the right way. You just, you have to have it. And part of that is, I'm gonna punch you right square in the face. That's gonna happen regardless. How are you gonna react to it? If you're gonna cry and walk away, you're not gonna win. If you're gonna take it and counter it, now we got a chance. You're gonna be a football player when you do the He built himself into a football player and became one of the most decorated winners in NFL history. He built himself into a broadcaster. Giant defense has really carried this team for forever. And was set to become the most popular in the business. He tried to build a football team, but that construction came crashing down. As a team president for more than seven seasons, he won just 31 of 115 games. Matt Millen knows that in both football and life, the building process can be long, painful, and complicated. For every reward, there's a risk. But he's never been afraid to start from scratch and dream big. I always said I'm gonna have a shop. When I get older, I'm gonna have a shop. My dad did not care about what passion you had about making sawdust, is what he used to tell me. He would say, you're getting an education. Well, I hated school. I mean, I couldn't stand sitting there studying. And I was good at it. I just didn't like it. I have a degree in marketing and a degree in finance. And I hate them both. <laughs> so as soon as I got drafted by the Raiders, I started buying tools. There's so many parallels between this and playing, it's ridiculous. Anybody can go out and play, but to do it really well and to turn it into a, a, an art form, that's kind of the beauty of it. That'll be beautiful. It's pretty neat to see a guy who made a living smashing into people, yet there's that, that side of creativity that can come out. The way he just sees things and sees it unfold and how it all fits together, I've always been amazed at, at how he does it. He just has a great ability to visualize, um, you know, what something can become. The kid from Hockendakwa, Pennsylvania, had a beautiful mind. But the sixth of Harry and Elizabeth's 11 children often was fighting with someone. And his father's way of stopping a fight was to have the combatants tow the line in the basement. Put the gloves on you. You want to fight? We're going to fight for real. And guess what? You're going to fight until you stop. I mean, you can't fight anymore. He wasn't going to break it up. So we would go down and we would bloody each other. The fighter found a new outlet for his aggression when his high school coach introduced him to weightlifting. I lifted like a maniac. In the summer, I lifted three times a day, six days a week and I ran in between. It was something that I could actually get my hands on and work at with the goal of it's gonna help. During his high school years, Millen gained over 100 pounds, and as a senior, he was bench pressing over 400. He'd also drawn the attention of Bill Mallory, the head coach at the University of Colorado. When Coach Mallory started telling Dad, Dad was like, hey, Coach Mallory from Colorado's here. I mean, he was, he was thoroughly impressed, and he's like, we want your son at Colorado. We need your son at Colorado. Do you know why, Mr. Millen? Um, and he was like, oh, yeah, well, yeah. he said, because he's a prick, and we need pricks at Colorado. And I'll never forget this. <laughs> I was standing right by my dad. My dad turned to my mom and said, Matt's a prick. Matt's a prick. They like that. <laughs> Dallas Cowboys star Randy White 
probably would have agreed with Mallory's assessment of Millen. White recruited Millen on behalf of the University of Maryland. Here's Randy White, man, the manster. It was just myself, Coach Malowski, and uh, Randy White. And so I was feeling pretty good about myself. I asked him if he wanted to arm wrestle. He had a little bit of a, little bit of a chip on his shoulder, uh, you know, even maybe a little cocky. So here we are in a little phys ed office. <laughs> and I start him off, oh, and, I, and I have him, and I have right here, I said, you're going down. You know, I probably let him take me down a little bit and then, you know, let him think he was getting somewhere. As he's taking him down, he's talking to him. How is an All-American, Rookie of the Year, All-Pro, a high school kid's beating you? And I look up and he was going like this. I thought, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. And then, boom, he almost broke my arm. <laughs> he, he threw my arm over so quick. With that, Matt jumps up out of the seat and cuffs, ran his both ears. His switch flipped. It was awesome. Randy spear tackles him. Puts him up in the air. And he said, four years from now, we'll go for real. And he, he meant it. I was like, yes, sir, Mr. White. <laughs> Not surprisingly, Millen didn't end up at Maryland. He became Joe Paterno's problem at Penn State. I can still vividly remember, for some reason, they were practicing on one of the fields in, in downtown State College, and we were allowed to go watch and Joe started screaming at him for something and threw him out of practice, and I just shook my head as, oh, he doesn't get it. <laughs> he had a little bit of a problem with authority, so. But on the field, Millen was in charge. As a junior, he was an All-American. As a senior, he once again butted heads with Paterno. Matt being Matt, he and Joe had that love-hate relationship. Uh, we had to do a running test, and as everyone knew, Matt wasn't uh, very good when it came to conditioning tests. And Joe's screaming at me, and I said, if I got to chase a guy for half a mile, he's going to score every time. And all the guys are laughing. Joe lost it. <laughs> Joe, Joe lost it. He kicked me off, kicked me off the team. It made me learn not to be selfish because the team's more important. That was it's a valuable lesson to learn. I learned it a hard way. Eventually, Millen was reinstated. He and Paterno remained close friends for the rest of Paterno's life. And as Millen headed to the NFL, he found a team that welcomed his fighting spirit. When I was at Penn State, I was considered one of the biggest outlaws and renegades they've ever had. You know, I got kicked off the team. They voted me to the all-delinquent team. I came out to the Raiders, and I was one of the most pristine, pure people they've ever seen. The college rebel had no trouble following the Raiders' code of conduct. Rule number one, cheating is encouraged. Rule number two, see rule number one. I can't believe it. How the heck do you expect me to play? I'm going to punch you in the face. That said to me, look, here's what we're going to do. Whatever it takes to win, we're going to do. Whatever it takes to win, you do. Just win, baby, was the Raiders' mantra. It became Millen's way of life. The former defensive end was moved to linebacker. He called the plays in the huddle for a veteran defense and regularly displayed his obsession for the game. He's single-minded, focused, is all about playing football. He didn't care about anything else. That was never more apparent than when he arrived at Super Bowl 15. I said, what the heck they have a ribbon on the Superdome for? They said the hostages were released. I was like, hostages? Oh, yeah. I had no idea. The world stopped. All that mattered was, hey, this is a Super Bowl. I was so focused. See, that was a that was a pretty seminal moment for me. Like, get a little perspective here. There are other things going on in the world. It's not just about football. But that's how focused you get. At least that's the way I had to operate. 
Millen's rookie season ended with a world championship. Three years later, the Raiders were back in the Super Bowl. We were a machine as a defense. I'd match that defense against any defense. I don't care who you put up there. You take the 85 Bears, you can take anybody you want. Millen was part of a dominant defensive performance. Look at that Millen up there. He is fired up. He was not part of the game's signature defensive play. Charlie Sumner, our coordinator, had a hunch. So Charlie's trying to yell to me. I don't hear him. So he sends Jack Squire again. I get to the sideline, like, what are you doing? And I start, he said, I got a hunch. And I was like, this hunch, man, I'm screaming at him. And Squirek picks it off. And I look, I'm like, ah! And I grab Charlie, and I picked him up, I'm like, great call! I wanted to choke him. Matt Bender was telling him, hey, that was a good substitution. You put in Squirek and took me out. Yeah, I wanted to be on the field, but hey, Great call. Again, it's another thing. Look, team first, me second. The team player knew his role and his skill set during his nine seasons with the Raiders. You know, I'm not going to run you a four or five every time, but I will beat a guy up. Well, he was a 255-pound inside linebacker who probably couldn't outrun five of our six defensive linemen. If Matt were a fighter, he'd want a 10 by 5 ring. He'd want you in a phone booth. Matt Billum, great day. Get in there. Come on, run at me. Let's go. Get in the pitch. You can make up for a lack of great speed by not making any mistakes. He knew the game, and he played it with a passion. He showed me as a scout, if you will, what a really good player has to do in order to take advantage of all the ability that he possesses. There isn't anything that he didn't do to make himself better. He just refused to be beaten. Plus, he was very forthright and very honest. There wasn't any BS with Matt Millen. He would tell you exactly what he thought. For a guy that could actually turn your head sideways with a hit and enjoyed contact, he was as close to a gentleman football player as you would ever want to meet. And that might strike people as incongruous given the nature of the sport. But there were two Matt Millens, the one on the field that would like to send you back to next Tuesday. We had a score quick, which we were fortunate to do. And then there's the guy off the field that could have a polite, intelligent conversation about anything. Millen's motor and his mouth were constantly running. Every time we'd break the huddle, uh, I would come to the line of scrimmage and he would yell, alert, alert, Mormon in the backfield, Mormon in the backfield. And he, that's just a perfect example of Matt. Like, he would use it to distract you. Also, it was funny. Matt, in my mind, brought the best parts of football. Now, this is the kind of night it was for the Raiders. Matt Millen's jogging off the field, boom, he goes down. The crowd gave him a cheer, he gave them a bow. Matt Millen was one of those gentlemen of the game that were vicious competitors, but uh, really understood uh, how we're in it all together. So it was a lot of fun to play against him. Somehow he'd gone from a college delinquent to a gentleman of the game. But if Steve Young thought it was fun to play against Millen, he was about to learn what it was like to have him as a teammate. From the time his father made him put boxing gloves on in the basement to settle a dispute with a sibling, Matt Millen was a fighter. To him, it was part of the game, part of being a good teammate. Matt's the guy you call at one in the morning in a snowstorm in a bad neighborhood with a flat tire, and Matt gets out of bed and Matt comes. Or you call him after a playoff loss to New England. So the game's over, and I'm walking off the field, and all of a sudden, this guy jumps up in Howie's face. He didn't even know who it was. He just thought it was a fan that came out that was uh, bothering Howie or whatever. And of course, you know, ha like Howie really needed help, so. I walked over, and I grabbed him by the back of the head and shook his head and threw him. And he got up and swung at me. I was like, OK. I ducked and 
and I freaking drilled him. Pow. Cut his eye open. I go into the locker room, and they come up to me and goes, uh, you might want to get an attorney for this. I said, for what? He said, well, it was the general manager for the Patriots. I'm like, oh, no. Right, wrong, indifferent, you got to back your, your guy. And he always did. He continued to do that when he joined the 49ers in 1989. What the defending champions quickly learned was that Millen not only fought opponents, he fought teammates. That season, Dick Buckus came to interview Millen for a CBS sports piece. While the film roll ran out, the microphone continued to record. Oh, he's changed it. You know, I started all those fights. You did? Heck yes. Were they good ones too? Staged or what? Heck no. I think these guys are a bunch of half of them. I started a lot of fights in San Francisco just to see where we're at. Yeah, I think Matt told me, he said, Charles, he said, man, you know what? If I got to kick your ass, I ain't going to make you black, but I'm going to beat you blue. I said, man, come on, brother. Help my brother out. Don't hurt me that bad, man. We're in over. If you did something wrong, he's going to let you know. The funny thing is, he's not going to let you know. He's going to let you know. <laughs> he's going to let you know. <laughs> Our leaders were set, you know, it was Ronnie's defense. Matt didn't come in to take over. He came in to say, hey, I belong here. I need to be a part of this. And here's what I bring. I bring this knowledge. Don't even worry about anything there. I'll take care of the trap on my side and just go. I bring this ability to be physical. And Otis Anderson gets upended by Matt Millen. Matt Millen, a Pro Bowl ball player last year with the Raiders. He's a pleasant addition to this 49ers squad. Some people don't want to do dirty work. And if it meant for us to win a football game, Matt was willing to do the dirty work. I just loved his attitude, man. Who wants to be known playing 14, 15 years and never come in your life? You know, who wants to be a loser? Matt wants to win at any cost. That's what Matt was all about. My vivid memories are on the planes with him. Hey guys. He, he was an interesting guy to talk to. As much as he was a football junkie, uh, he was well read. He was a thoughtful guy. I needed people to bounce things off that not necessarily had been here the whole time. The situation with Joe and I was always tenuous and tough. And Matt was just kind of a therapist for me, helping me through some tough times. It made a big difference in my life, and I'm grateful to him. Millen quickly became a part of the 49ers family. And the father of four wanted the 49ers to be a part of his family. We would invite all the bachelor guys on the team to come over for a home-cooked meal. It was a kind of a standing invitation on Wednesday and Thursday. He'd open the door and he'd be in his underwear, you know, and a, a t-shirt, you know, walking around with all the kids, you know, it's just, I was mad. We'd go in, we'd sit down, we'd eat, and then he'd say, you have enough? And we'd go, yeah, and he goes, well, then you gotta go. So, like, we'd be there like 25 minutes, <laughs> but it was great. I mean, we, you know, Pat was sweet, and, but that was Matt. Millen kept the dinner time tradition going when he went to Washington in 1991. He said, you guys don't have anywhere to eat. You guys probably can't cook. My wife's going to make a lot of food. Come over to the house. I'll, I'll never forget that. A lot of guys don't do that. They don't connect in that way or try to connect across generations in the NFL. And this is a guy who's a 12-year vet, and he's hanging out with the first and second year guys. So that's pretty special. Another tradition Millen was big on, winning Super Bowls. Tries to go up the middle, and the 49ers, Matt Millen, comes. He won his third ring with the 49ers. Very, 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 Thank you. very much. Thank you. I'll tell you what, I'm happy for you. And his fourth with the Redskins. He didn't come in and try to take the team over, but he had his own way of leadership. He played the Cowboys. First play of the game, I'm covering Alvin Harper. They run a deep route. He comes down with it. It's a 40-yard gain. We come back in the huddle and people are going crazy. What's going on out there? What is the deal? What are you guys doing back there? And, uh, and Matt looks at me, he says, Hugh, you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm okay. He said, all right, everybody, Hugh's okay, let's go. And then you can hear a pin drop. It's behind us. Come back to the next series, I pick one off, take it back to the house. He had the ability to settle the group down like that. 
he said I was okay, everybody knew I was okay. What Matt was, was super smart. Now, he was more the physical linebacker that took things on. I don't think anybody kept him in a nickel package. He was headed for the bench. <laughs> Get him out of there. Millen's run-stuffing ability helped the Redskins win the physical NFC East. But in the playoffs, Washington faced teams with wide open passing offenses. So Millen was deactivated. It's about winning. And if that's what it takes to win, then go ahead, do it. And I told Gibbsy, if I were sitting in your shoes, I would do the same thing. He never took that the wrong way. And I think he was a big part of, you know, behind the scenes. trying to help every, every, every way he could. And I always respect that about him. I say Matt, and Matt's a man's man. He still brought the same passion, same energy, the same leadership, still held you accountable. The born leader, Matt Millen, is one of my heroes. Following that game, I was more tired and more mentally drained than I had ever been in a game. And even though I didn't make a single tackle, I felt as much part of that win as I ever had. After 12 years in the NFL, Matt Millen retired with four Super Bowl rings. He was done as a player, have a great game, fellas. Just keep it tight for me here. But he didn't leave the game. Hi, everybody. I'm Tim Ryan with Matt Millen, former 49er here at Candlestick Park. To work with him was remarkable because he would see the game so quickly. And he could really pick out what was the essence of what made a play work. Watch Woodall come off the corner. He's going to turn this thing right back inside the plumber. And he up. immediately hit what was called the talkback key and tell Richie Zients and me, hey, did you see what Johnson did right there? And the way we started framing our cameras, and changing the way we did isolation framing for a receiver. When they call your number to block, you got to do this. You put Marcus Patton on your back. He was so natural at being himself, and he had no airs or pretensions about him. And when Fox started up, right after John Madden and Pat Summerall, Matt Millen was the guy they wanted to get. But look, right at the end, you know, it can get most of it back, but guess, guess what couldn't come back right there? People wanted to listen to Matt because they weren't going to get the company speak. They weren't going to have the commissioner whisper in his ear, this is what you should say. Nothing there, and that is a piteous call. If that's a hold, all right, I quit. And aside all those weapons... The it was clear that Millen was comfortable behind a microphone, but he was never happy in front of a camera. Yeah, and that's never going to change. Matt hated to do on cameras. He hated to look into the camera and say, hello, you know, this is what I think is going to happen. He felt that... That just wasn't what he did. Stand by. Camera's ready. Next on NFL Films, the real all-time sack list. Cut it. Matt, what? you're a, you're a TV personality. What did I do? You, you can do better than that. You know, it's supposed to be a tease. You want people to come back. You got to give us a little bit That's of That's about as good as it gets. This is what I hate about TV. What? The stuff you have to look at, that stupid camera, I can't stand. I hate that thing. Don't say, I'll say this, then you say this, then I'll say this, then you say that. I can't do that. It's a great advantage. Millen didn't like to play a part. And ever since his playing days, he certainly didn't like to look the part. He'd show up for the season with a pair of overalls, a couple of T-shirts, a couple of pairs of underwear, I'm hoping, and a toothbrush. He'd go on the road with a toothbrush in his pocket. No dop kit, no bag, no clothes. It didn't change very much when he went into the broadcasting business either. Sometimes he would be in Zuba pants and sneakers and have a shirt and tie on. Yeah, they only shoot from here up. Well, I don't care. I have Zubas on all the time. Those things are awesome. Well, I'd like to thank you for getting dressed up and shaving thank for you. our interview. Thank I mean, you very that, much. Yeah. It's pretty good, isn't it? <laughs> Matt's not spending any money on clothes, and he steals half of my stuff. I think the only sport coat he had when we played was the one that he borrowed and had tailored to fit him. How about that? How about that? 
It has my name in it. Millen wasn't happy in a coat and tie, and eventually he became disillusioned in the broadcast booth. And you get done with it, and you're like, all right, it was a great game. Oh, you guys did pretty well. Says who? How do you know? Did you win? You didn't win. Did you dominate it? Did you not dominate it? I mean, what did you do? You didn't do anything. We just talked about a game. It would drive me nuts. And so I had that conversation with John one day on the bus, and I said, John, what we do is really kind of shallow. And he said, listen, we live for this. If you say that it's shallow, then what you're saying is our lives are shallow. And I said, yeah, that's what I'm saying. He said, I think you better check that. And I thought to myself, I don't want to offend him. <laughs> so that bothered me. There had to be more. I mean, those are things you just don't teach. You just have to have greatness to do this kind of thing. Watch he was as good a broadcaster of football as there was. And he was destined, I, in my mind, to be the number one broadcaster at Fox as soon as John retired. Following the 2000 season, Millen would stop talking about NFL teams to see if he could build one himself. Matt, we have the game ball signed by everybody for you. Everyone on our crew love working with you, if indeed. This is our finale. Well, sometimes you have to move on to bluer or greener pastures. <laughs> and you were thinking about taking the job with the Lions. Did anybody tell you, hey, Matt, stay in broadcasting? Oh, you know, I mean, you, you don't have to worry about who wins or loses. Right. And that's what you just said is exactly why I had to get back. You don't win, you don't lose. For Matt Millen, football and life are black and white. He struggled with the gray air of broadcasting. He needed to be defined by whether or not he was winning or losing games. Number one in the whole world! And that right there is, I think, why he took the Detroit job. Matt Mellon, new president, CEO, Detroit Lions. Broadcasting wasn't touching that fighter mentality. He was tired of going zero and zero. Coming up. It was as if here comes the Messiah on Palm Sunday. This is the guy that everyone wanted. He's going to bring the championship to the state of Michigan. I bought this place. The house is 1775. And so I wanted to uh, restore the whole thing. Then I tore the roof off the house, gutted the house, took it right down to the stone. Matt is a Finnish carpenter. Matt's all about building, building a family, building a team. I think that trying to make the run at building a championship team was his dream. I've been involved in football my whole life. That's what I am, I'm a football player. I'm sure he felt that he could more than handle the job. That's what I know. The difficulty with that is it's not as easy as it appears. I was surprised because he was entering at the, such a high level. If he's going to give it to you, give it to him. Take it. As a knowledgeable football guy, I could recommend him, but as an overseer of everything, it'd be hard to do. You have to grow up a little bit in through the inner workings of the National Football League, and it's not easy to come out of a booth into a situation like that. I mean, I know you think you got the answers, but you don't have the answers. How do they look? Any better today? Matt Millen thought that by leaving the broadcast booth, he could get closer to football again. He didn't realize that he was moving further away from the game he loved. I was more than a general manager, so I was the president and CEO of the place. And I guess what surprised me the most was how little football we did, or that I was involved with. Certainly, he never th sat there and said, well, you know, I'm going to have to deal with, deal with all these HR issues, and, and then we're going to have to figure out how to finance this new stadium and, and get people in the seats and market it properly. He didn't talk about any of that stuff. That wasn't in the decision-making at all. And then you get there, and it's like, oh, this is what a president does. Like, I'm reading on family law. But what do I care about family law? You have so many days when you're pregnant that you can take or your husband can take. I don't care. Take them. How, you know, all I want to do is win. That didn't happen. Millen lost 12 in a row to begin his career in Detroit and won just five games in his first two seasons. Oh, my goodness. Well, the nightmare continues for the Lions. 
everything in this man's life worked out perfectly at the maximum level until he comes to Detroit, and then nothing works. So there's no reason for him to think in 2001 to come here and think that he doesn't have the right ideas when the people he leaned on were like Bill Parcells and John Madden. You know, he wasn't just talking to the bartender and the man who ran the shoe shine shop. He's talking about Hall of Fame people. Didn't work. I know there's no simple answer to this, but what do you think went wrong for Matt in Detroit? This is going to sound very simple. He didn't pick the right players. During his tenure in Detroit, Millen drafted 61 players. Only three, Sean Rogers, Roy Williams, and Calvin Johnson, made it to a Pro Bowl. If I had to go back and say, what would you change? I would probably go back and follow John Madden's and Bill Parcell's advice to me, and that was make your own mistakes, don't make somebody else's. John would say to me all the time, your name's at the top of the list. You make a, short, a decision, make sure it's your decision. I acquiesced too, too often. From 2002 through 2008, um, I was in all of the draft rooms. The Mike Williams draft, I got really mad at him because we had talked all up to that point about DeMarcus Ware is a stud. He's gonna be a great pass rusher. He would fit our scheme and he'd be the guy that I take. He gets to pick 10 and there's DeMarcus Ware. So I'm thinking, all right, we got our guy. And then all of a sudden there's chatter from some other people in the room that, you know what, if we got this wide receiver and paired him with Roy Williams and some of the other weapons we have, we'd be a really potent offense. And I can see his mind starting to change. The Detroit Lions select Mike Williams, wide receiver, USC. Are you kidding me? And I'm like, great. The buffoon just picked another wide receiver. That's what everyone's gonna think. In three consecutive drafts, Millen spent a first round pick on a wide receiver. Number one draft picks on offense. Yeah. You got your good football team. It doesn't now. matter. If you uh, draft them one, it's that they play like one. Being in all those war rooms, if there's anything that I could say about dad that he could have done better, it was stick to your guns. And I'm not making excuses for him because those picks are his picks. Matt Millen did not build a Matt Millen football team. He was a tough son of a bitch as a football player, and he didn't build the team the same way. I think one of Matt's weaknesses is also one of his greatest strengths. He's the consummate team player. So when his team comes to him and, and maybe he didn't agree, he went with the team aspect. I think what made him a great football player and being a team player devastated him and ruined him as a general manager. Well, the cheering going on around the stadium as there's a sign. <laughs> Security has been trying to get it. On December 4th, 2005, the Lions were hosting the Vikings. A fan took to running up and down the aisles of the stadium with the sign reading, Fire Millen. Hey, even Matt's laughing at that. <laughs> First, I just checked to make sure it wasn't one of my kids running up and down with that. <laughs> I think it was the tipping point from making the Matt Millen era a local story to just a national story. There's the tackle. Football experts say it was the only time a Lions employee had caught anything all season. Well, I understood the frustration. Listen, Detroit fans are great fans, and they're passionate. They're what you want. They're an educated group. They love football. Big play today, Stan. Let's make some plays out there. One thing about Matt, he has a lot more in common with the people that were angry at him than the people that were angry probably realized. He wasn't one of these rich kids that was removed from everything and was just handed the keys to his dad's Ferrari and said, I don't understand why you're giving me speeding tickets. I mean, that was not Matt Millen. Matt understood why fans were angry. Fire Millen became a way of greeting somebody practically as you walked down the street. They would just say Fire Millen to each other as a nod of hello. The signs showed up everywhere, from comic strips to websites to college game day basketball shows in Kansas. We're back at 8 o'clock Eastern time. At uh, Lambeau Field, 
at Soldier Field and in the Metrodome, they did not chant Fire Millen. In fact, they would carry around signs that said, Keep Millen. And that's exactly what the Lions did. There were other factors here in the state of Michigan. The economy was crumbling, auto companies were struggling, people were getting laid off. And here you have this guy who's got the job that everybody would love to have, and he's the one who should be fired and isn't. He was given a contract extension by the Ford family, and that was kind of the final explosion. There was the Millen Man March outside of a Lions Bengals game. That was funny. That was Rob Parker, the Millen Man March. I've told him that. It was very clever. Not to make light of the fans' passion, but I wanted to go out and march in the Millen Man March, you know? I, Dad didn't let me, but I wanted to get the shirt and, and wear it. After that year, I come home to Christmas, and the, the kids are standing there and they're like, Dad, do you like the tree? I go, yeah, it looks beautiful. My youngest one goes, do you like the angel? And I look up at the angel, and there's an angel on the top with a fire Millen sign. <laughs> I'm like, well done. All jokes aside, the man who won so much as a player was in an entirely unfamiliar position. The part that just eats at you is losing. Losing is absolutely brutal. It just gnaws at you, and it never stops. He didn't understand why. Why can't I figure out how to fix this? What is the issue? Now, I know some people will say, well, he was the issue. <laughs> Tell you what it did. It gives you resolve to want to work harder. I just became like a hermit in the building. I just lived there. I slept there. I rarely left. When he did leave, it usually was for a quick trip home to visit his family in Pennsylvania. That didn't go over big in Detroit. I think some fans didn't believe he was working that hard because he was still commuting back to live in Pennsylvania. He never moved his family to Detroit. I'm not going to let my family suffer. They, they already are because I don't get to see them, and I'm, a, I'm big on family. And so if I have a chance to get home to see my kids, I go home to see my kids. There is this perception that you have to be fully committed to your job to turn something around as big as turning around the Lions, and he didn't seem as committed as he should have been. Now, maybe that's not fair. Maybe that's just window dressing. Maybe that's just an appearance. But yes, the fans did not like that at all. And there's Matt Millen, obviously disappointed with the way his team has played this season. There are a lot of situations where you can point to people and say, that decision made some sense, it didn't work out, and that was it. That was that guy's downfall. These two mistakes cost him his job. That wasn't the case with Matt. It wasn't one or two mistakes. It wasn't, hey, if we'd had this quarterback or that player. He was not capable of building a winning team. That's true of most of us. Matt's just the one who got the chance to do the job. You never went into Mr. Ford's office and handed him your resignation? No. Did you ever think about it? No. No, I, I don't believe that. There was an easy way out on a number of occasions. Uh, but, you know, you just have to know Matt. That's not Matt. I think it was that, that fighter mentality that drove him to go down with the ship. Matt Millen refuses to quit. I think that's why he succeeded as much as he did as a player. You can't make me quit. You can't do it. It's impossible. William Clay Ford wants to win so much, but he wants to win with his guys, and he had great affection for Matt. I feel bad for him. I want him to win in the worst way. I have a great affinity for Mr. Ford. The opinions of millions of other people in this state meant nothing. Those two qualities are why Matt stayed as long as he did. In 2008, with the Lions on their way to the only 0-16 season in NFL history, Millen was fired after a week three loss to the 49ers. For my dad, it meant you failed. You didn't figure it out. And that, I think, was the hardest thing for him. You can't make excuses. No explanations. Explanations are just excuses after the fact. My name's at the top of the list. John was right. You're the one who gets kicked right square in the rear. And that's, that's the way it should be. I mean, you're responsible. The biggest thing you learn, and once you're in that position, is you benefit from the previous mistakes you made. 
You know, Matt didn't have that. I talked to him after it was all over, and uh, he said, boy, I didn't realize it was so hard. I said, yeah. It had to be one of the more painful experiences of his life. I can only imagine the competitor that he is, um, how much he wanted to go out on the field and try to fix it. I mean, this is a guy that's a GM that still is acting like a player. Look at I mean, he is down there. He's playing it. I would be better served to lead the battle. Give me the sword. Let's fight. I'll guarantee the victory. But if I'm back there writing up the battle plan, and then I have to watch it, give me the sword. Let's take the hill. There's between 15 and 16,000 plants. When they're in full bloom, it's, it really is beautiful. Adjacent to the Millen's greenhouse is a reminder of who is responsible for nature's beauty. That same stone existed in 2001, before Matt Millen began his tenure in Detroit. It's 1 Corinthians 3.7, that neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. And that basically says this, you can do all you want. And if it's not ordained, we're sunk. So let me tell you something. This better be ordained, this lion's thing. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew Millen is both a lawyer and a pastor. He understands the painful truth in 1 Corinthians. Sometimes, despite your best efforts to be the best at what you're working towards, it's not going to work out. That was something that he certainly saw in Detroit. He worked at it like a madman. He did everything he could, everything he could think to do to try to make that team grow. You're going to fail at times. The failing is inconsequential to me. It's the passion and the effort that you give while trying to succeed. And I think Matt exemplifies that in everything that he does. That'll work. The cabinets he started building in the spring are done. All right. They're ready for installation in the Biblical Counseling Center, affiliated with his son's church. Uh-oh. The boss is here. Yes, I was just counseling over in the church. Matt's wife, Pat, is a counselor there. We added this piece down here. Not everything he has built has been a success. Kick it over to line it up. But there is balance oh, yeah. in Millen's life. Oh, yeah. And there is still football. Career He's returned to the broadcast booth. Yeah, what we'll probably see is a series out of them. If they get the score, you won't see the rest of the day. But here's what you did see out of them. You saw the accuracy. Matt Millen knows that football comes with a game plan. However, there's no blueprint for life. But Millen is the architect of his life, one that is very much a work in progress. You talk to anybody, and they'll tell you there's a few pieces missing. <laughs> As each new life experience comes, it teaches us something else. Has he figured himself out? I don't, I, I don't think he has. I haven't figured him out. You know, John Madden told me one time, he said, you know, when God made us, he put a little bit of not done yet in all of us. There's some great truth to that. And I also believe this, all we are is a collection of all we've been. And I count it a blessing for all the experiences that I've had, now, good and bad. You learn the most from the bad. I wouldn't change any of it. If you can add to that a little faith, a little hope, a little grace, you have a better chance.